Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24, and today I'm going to talk to you about how to keep your head on straight in a world gone crazy. And this is the first time I've ever taught on this subject in the United States, so pray for me and stay with me. Is that all right? But tonight we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus is describing end time events to his disciples. And when you come to the time of Jesus, you find that in Israel there was a real fascination with end time events. Just like people are fascinated with that subject today, at the time of Jesus' arrival, particularly between the Old and the New Testaments called an intertestamental period, there developed a real fascination with the coming of the Lord. And people wanted to know when are all these things going to happen? And when you come to Matthew chapter 24, Jesus and his disciples are seated on the Mount of Olives. How many of you have ever been to Jerusalem? Can I see your hands? Well, you know that when you're seated on the Mount of Olives, you have a panoramic view of the ancient city of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. And from the Mount of Olives, you can look over and you could see, at that particular time, you could have seen the temple standing there. It is such a prophetic place on the face of the earth. And while Jesus was sitting there with his disciples, they entered into a discussion about end time events. And when we come to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3, the Bible says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples come unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the age? And in this verse, we find exactly the same identical questions that people are still asking today. Tell us when, when will these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? In fact, if you have an ink pen tonight, you should circle these words in verse 3, the word when, the word what, the word sign, the word end, and the word world. And before we go any further, first we're going to stop and we're going to look at these words. They said when shall these things be? They wanted to know, when is this going to happen? In fact, when you read this in the Greek, it's very specific. It's very demanding. Lord, tell us when. We want to know exactly when is all this going to happen, and what shall be the sign of thy coming? The word what in Greek is the word T, and the word T is very important. It's just the little letter T-I, the word T, which in Greek describes the most minute, minuscule detail, which means they were getting very exact with the Lord. They weren't asking for general signs. They were asking for very concrete, specific information. When is all this going to happen, and what, exactly what, will be the sign of thy coming? Even the word sign is important. This particular word sign is the word semion, which has several meanings in the New Testament. But one of the primary meanings of the word semion, even during the time of the New Testament, this word sign was used to describe road markers, which you would see as you travel along the road to tell you where you are in your journey. Denise and I live outside the city of Moscow. We live really about 14 kilometers outside the city. That's maybe about 10 miles. And where we live, it is the countryside. It's very pretty. We live on a piece of land with a forest behind our house. And we live in really in a pretty secluded place. It's amazing because where we live is called a village, but our village has 800,000 people in it. <laughs> Moscow's a big city. I mean, it's a big city. There's 29 million people every day in transit in the city of Moscow. Just so you'll understand, 29 million is the population of the state of Texas. That is the population of Moscow. For me to drive to our office, which is 10 kilometers, just 10 kilometers, which is about six miles, during a weekday, it takes two hours. Somebody says, why don't you ride a bike? Because riding a bike would be an act of suicide. You would be killed on a bike in the city of Moscow. Anybody who rides a bike, is they have a death wish. If Denise says, Rick, let's go downtown and have a hamburger, that's a serious question. 
I don't, I don't know, a hamburger might, it might cost us four hours to have a hamburger. Last Christmas, we decided on Christmas to go downtown to have Christmas dinner, December 25th. Well, December 25th is not Christmas in Russia. Russia's January the 7th. That's Christmas. Yeah, we're two weeks later. We're by the old calendar. You guys are all on the new calendar. But on December 25th, Denise says, I don't care if we've lived in Russia for 30 years. December 25th, it is Christmas in my mind. We have to do something for Christmas. So our kids are at work. It's just a work day. Our kids don't even want to celebrate Christmas on December 25th because they grew up in Russia. To them, Christmas is January the 7th. So one year, we went to the circus. <sighs> How many people go to the circus on Christmas just looking for something to do? But we had fun because that day in the circus, there were grizzly bears wearing tutus skating on ice. You should have seen them with one foot up in the air going round and round in circles. We had a blast at the circus that Christmas. But last Christmas, Denise said, let's go downtown and have dinner. So we decided where we were gonna go. God is my witness. We drove six hours and we were halfway to our destination. I said, honey, that's it. We're going to just stop and get something to eat and turn around and go back home. That's where we live. Well, where we live is considered to be the country. It really is. You can see farmhouses. You can see pasture. And then you see all these huge buildings. But you get on the road to go into Moscow. And as you go into Moscow, there are signs. And the signs tell you where you are on the road headed to Moscow, 10 kilometers. You drive a little further, and the closer you get to the city, the environment begins to change. Traffic begins to get denser. Things begin to become a little more industrial. More high-rise buildings begin to be built, and suddenly you see another sign that says Moscow, six kilometers. As you travel closer and closer to the city, the environment continues to change, and there's another sign which says Moscow, three kilometers. And finally, you come to Moscow where there is a huge sign that says Moscow. And when you pass that sign, you're no longer traveling toward the city, but you have crossed the border and you have entered into Moscow. The word signs that is used here, the word Simeon, would describe that. And so, when the disciples said, tell us what are the sign of thy coming, they were literally saying, Lord, what are the prophetic road markers we will see along the way to tell us where we are on our journey to the end of the world? The word end, in Greek, is the word suntaleas. It really means the wrap-up, the finalization the last act, the last days, the final moments. You could translate it, the wrap up. The King James Version says of the world. That's a bad translation because the world is never going to end. It's just going to be transformed. This is the word Ionas. A better translation would be the end of the age. And so here's what they were saying to the Lord. Lord, when? When are these things going to be? T. Tell us concretely, exactly, in the most minute, specific detail, we want concrete information. What will be the sign, the road markers we'll see as we're headed toward the wrap-up of this particular age that we're living in? And then Jesus begins in Matthew chapter 24 to give multiple signs that we will see that tell us we're coming closer and closer to the wrap-up of the age. Now, when most people teach on the subject of prophecy, which I rarely do, most people say that Israel is the primary marker to let us know where we are in the last days. And Israel, certain, is one of them. That is one of them. But what is the very first marker Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 24? He described wars, rumors of wars, famines. He described all kinds of things. But look at what Jesus said in verse 4. What did he say? He said, take heed that no man 
deceive you. They said, Lord, concretely, what will be the sign? And when Jesus begins to enumerate the signs, which indicate we have passed the barrier and we have entered into the territory of the last days, the first things Jesus does is say, behold, beware, behold, that no man deceive you. And when you read this in the Greek, when he says, take heed, it is a Greek word, blepete, which means look, listen. It is so strong. It's like Jesus was trying to jolt them or jar them. And there's no doubt that when Jesus said this word, blepo, they literally perked up to listen to what he was about to say. And Jesus said, the primary indicator you've ind entered the end of the age will be that you enter into a period of worldwide deception. And the word deceive that is used in this verse is not even the normal word for deceive. It is a Greek word, planeo. Now, forgive me for giving you a lot of Greek, but that's what I do. And this really illuminates the Bible for us. This particular word, deceive, the word planeo, means to moral, morally wander. It describes people who once walked people, cities, nations or groups of nations. It could even describe society as a whole, which once walked on a very solid, well-known moral, moral path, but now, now, something has happened and they have veered off of a course that was familiar to them, and now they have taken a new direction and in fact, this word planeo, as it was used in the Septuagint and the intertestamental period, describes a person, a nation, or nations that have veered so far off track that now morally they are wandering and they are teetering on the edge of a very treacherous and dangerous cliff. They have taken the most dangerous route possible. It's not that they didn't know the right way, they knew the right way and they veered from it. Something has happened and they have departed from that path and now they have taken a new route. And Jesus says, you will really know you've entered the end of the age, last day's territory, when delusion begins to pervade society. And in fact, this word deceive, here translated, the Greek word planeo, translated deceive, is the very same word which the Apostle Paul uses in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, where he says that delusion will enter society at the end of the age. You could really translate it, beware, behold, take heed, lest delusion take you. And the Holy Spirit speaking through Jesus, now recorded in Matthew chapter 24, prophesies that one of the primary indicators we've entered the end of the age is when delusional thinking, delusional thinking begins to be released in society. And before we leave here tonight, I'm going to show you in the Bible, concretely, that the Bible prophesies at the very end of the age, hordes of demons will be released into the earth to release delusional thinking in society. And my friends, we are living in the age of delusion. We're living in the age of delusion. Now I want you to go to Romans chapter 1. And in Romans chapter 1, I want to show you what the Apostle Paul said about a society that veers off track. And what you have in Romans chapter 1 is absolute genius. Only the Holy Spirit could have written these verses. And in Romans chapter 1, the Holy Spirit, speaking through Paul, is telling us what happens to a society that veers off track. And notice what he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, because, and I'm reading from the King James Version, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, to birds, to four-footed beasts, and to creeping things, wherefore God gave them up. Let's look at these verses. First of all, in verse 21, it says, because that when they what? Knew God. Everybody say knew. This word knew is the Greek word which means to know. 
It's not the word epignosis, which describes personal knowledge, but general knowledge. And here the Bible is describing a time when society generally had a reverence for things that were divine, a reverence for things that were holy. Even if they weren't saved, even if they didn't go to church, there was a kind of a sanctity. There was a reverence in society for things related to God. But when society had that, rather than embracing it, they glorified him not as God, or we find there is a turning from God, and here is how the veering begins. This is how the veering begins. The Bible clearly tells us over and over in the book of Proverbs and in the book of Psalms that the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. That's the beginning of knowledge. And when men reject the fear of the Lord and refuse to acknowledge him, it does not make them smarter. You're going to see in this scripture, people become moronic when they depart from a knowledge of God. I'm going to show you in the scripture. Because that when they knew God, when they generally appreciated him, acknowledged him, when they generally knew God, They glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. In fact, rather than be thankful for what they had, they begin to feel that they were entitled for everything that they had and became vain in their imaginations. The word vain is a translation of the word matthios, which means wasted, wasted. The word imaginations is actually the Greek word dialogismos, which is the word for rational thinking. And now we find that they're thinking processes. Here it's translated imaginations, but in fact it's their reasoning processes, their thinking processes, their logic becomes wasted, and their foolish heart was darkened. He's talking about society that turns from God. Well, what does that mean, their foolish heart was darkened? We have to stop and think for a moment, what does the heart do in the human body? The heart pumps. And what does it pump? It pumps blood. How much of your body is affected by blood? Every part of your body. There's blood in every part of your body because your heart is pumping and pumping and pumping and pumping. Your heart never stops pumping blood, pumping blood, pumping blood, pumping blood. But now in verse 21... We find that when society ceases to glorify God, ceases to acknowledge him, turns from him and veers away from him, their logic, their reasoning processes becomes wasted. And rather than pump blood in society, the heart of society begins to pump darkness. And it pumps darkness and pumps darkness and pumps darkness until finally that darkness begins to pervade every single part of society. And in verse 22, the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul says these departers, these wanderers profess themselves to be wise, but in fact they become fools. The word professing describes what they say about themselves alleging themselves to be, declaring themselves to be wise. The word wise is from the word sophos. Declaring themselves, asserting themselves to be sophisticated, intellectually advantaged above everybody else, the leaders of the new edge, of a new way of thinking, progressive thinkers, especially enlightened to lead the way into a new age. The Holy Spirit says, in fact, they became fools, And the word fools is a Greek word moreno, and it is, in fact, where we get the word for morons. This is not my opinion. That is a direct translation. It describes people that are mentally ill or mentally deranged. It is the equivalent of saying anybody who would think like this, even though they allege that they are advantaged, their thinking clearly means they're mentally deranged. They're morons in the way that they conclude things. And then it says in verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God. The word change is very interesting. It really means to exchange, to exchange. It says if you have two things on the table, 
You're aware of both of them. Now you have to decide which one you want. You're going to make a trade. You're going to make a bargain. You weigh them and you decide which one you want. They literally trade in God. They exchange the glory of the incorruptible God. Now this is a very interesting verse. Into an image made like to corruptible. Look at the order. Made like to corruptible what? Man. And then what? Birds. And then what? Four-footed beasts, and then what? Creeping things. What in the world is this verse? Man, birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. Verse 23 is so genius. Only the Holy Spirit could have written verse 23. Verse 23 in one verse is a snapshot or it is a history of human idolatry. How did human idolatry begin? It began with the worship of creeping things. The Egyptians worshiped beetles. They worshiped snakes. They worshiped crocodiles. They worshiped creeping things. Follow the history of idolatry, and you find that as man mind begins to ascend, then they go up a realm, and they begin to worship four-footed beasts, cows, cats, four-footed beasts. Finally, by the time that you come to the Roman Empire, they're no longer worshiping creeping things or four-footed beasts. Now they're worshiping birds. Birds were worshiped, especially during the time of the Roman Empire. You find that man's thoughts are beginning to ascend and ascend. And finally, Paul, speaking under the inspiration of the Spirit, says at the very end of the age, at the apex of idolatry, It'll no longer be creeping things. It'll no longer be four-footed beasts. It will no longer be birds. But man will worship man. The apex of idolatry. That's what this verse is. He's telling us where it goes. But now wait. It is a fact that when you worship something, you want to become one with the object of your worship. You want to become one with what you worship. No one wants to worship from a distance. You want to taste what you worship, experience what you worship. And since man at the end of the age will enter into the worship of man, and my friends, it's exactly where we are in the day that we live in. Man is the center of the universe. What we want to do is more important than the law of God. Oh, read it. Read it throughout the Bible. The Bible talks in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 about the society at the end of the world being a lawless society. Lawless. What that word lawless means? It doesn't mean everybody's going to be criminals. It means without the law of God. They have thrown off the law of God because they no longer find the law of God to be convenient for their lifestyle. They don't like it. It's no longer fashionable, so they are lawless. They put the law of God, the established word of God, to the side. It's a relic of the past. It was good then, but it's no longer applicable now. And society as a whole begins to reject the standards of Scripture. They become lawless. And man becomes the center of his universe. And we find this doctrine even in the church. We do. When you hear any preaching that says, God above everything else just wants you to be happy. Be very careful about that teaching. You know, God is not just concerned about you being happy. God is concerned about you walking right and doing what's right. And when you do what's right, sometimes, guess what? You're not happy. But you will be happy eventually if you'll do what's right. But if you make all your decisions on the basis of what's going to make you feel good and what's going to make you happy, my friends, you're, don't go, you're going down a wrong path. That is the wrong path for you to go down. That is a very man-centered teaching. It's a lawless kind of teaching. Well, because man's going to worship himself, how will God respond to this? And the answer is in verse 24. Wherefore, wherefore, God gave them up. Now here's where people say, yep, that's the problem. God just washed his hands. God just said, I'm done with them. God gave them up. 
That's a bad translation. You know why? First of all, it's not what the Greek says. Secondly, God never gives anybody up. God always holds out hope for every single person. But the word that is used here, a better translation would be wherefore God. Are you ready? Wherefore God released them. Release them. Is that what, is that what you want? I won't restrain you. Go get it. God will let you go after anything you want. If you want to sin, God will not stop you. God will say, it's your choice. You can do what you want to do. If you want to worship man, fine. Go get it. God released them. We're living in the day when God is releasing society. Not giving up. He holds out hope, but God says, if this is the way you want to go, I'm not going to stop you. You can do what you wish. If you want to go that way, that's your choice. God will allow us to pursue what we wish. God released them. And notice what the Bible says. God released them to what? Uncleanness. <laughs> the word uncleanness here is a Greek word which describes something that is foul, something that is lewd, and it has a sexual connotation. God released them to sexually foul thoughts through the lusts of their own what? hearts. This is what was in their heart. So God just released them to it. And notice the result of this to do what? To dishonor their own bodies between themselves. The word dishonor would be better translated to displace their bodies or to put bodies where bodies do not naturally belong. It is misplaced bodies to misplace their bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. Look at the next verse. For this cause God did what? Gave them up. The Greek means God means God released them unto vile affections. The Greek says displaced passion displaced passion or confused passions. It's real passion. It's not questioning their passion. They have real passion. They have real lust. They have real desire, but it's displaced. It's being expressed in the wrong way. It's an age of confusion. And then he explains what he's talking about. For even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of error which was meat. Then look in verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. It's not that they didn't know God. They did know God. They knew him. We already saw back in verse 21 that generally they knew God as a whole, as a society, but they no longer found God to be fashionable. They did no longer want to live according to his standards. Therefore, they throw off the law of God. Anomos is the Greek word. They become a lawless people embracing a lawless life. No longer living by the fixed principles and the standards of the word of God, but creating their own way. That's why Jesus used the word deception. Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, a period when people begin to wander, aimlessly wander, wander, wander. And in fact, when Jesus used the word deceive, that word planeo in Matthew chapter 24, verse 4, was also used to describe an animal that wandered so far off track it could not find its way back home. When you put all this together, the Bible's prophesying society is going to get so far off track, it will not be able to find its way back. And verse 28 says, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So God gave them over. Again, the Greek word peridokin, it can be translated, God released them. He released them to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Well, what is a reprobate mind? 
You know, most of us probably grew up hearing that word reprobate. I always heard the word reprobate. If you called somebody a reprobate, you were really saying the worst thing that you could say about a person. But the word reprobate, in fact, is the Greek word adokimos. The word dokimos describes something that is good, something that's fitting, something that is approved. It's really excellent. But if you put an A on the front of it, it reverses the condition. It's something that was once wonderful, it was once excellent, it was once magnificent, but now through some process, that which began as excellent has become corrupted. The word reprobate describes a person whose mind has been so bombarded with wrong images and wrong information that now his mind is slowly becoming modified to think new thoughts. He's no longer thinking the way that he used to think, and now his mind has become so affected, it has become so tainted that he has lost the ability to discern that evil is evil. And in fact, he may even think that evil is all right. And this is what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, when he says there will come a time when men will call evil good and good evil. They will trade darkness for light and bitter for sweet. They will lose the ability to discern what is right and what is wrong. That is a reprobate mind. And by the way, if you're reprobate, it doesn't mean you're reprobate in every area of your life. There are some Christians that are reprobate. They come to church that they have compartmental areas of their mind where they have allowed their mind to be modified by the thinking of the world. And their mind is being tainted, it's being affected, it's being changed. And in that area of their thinking, they're becoming reprobate in their thinking. It describes a mind that's bombarded with so much information, it no longer thinks right. And actually, the best example of this is Lot. You know, Lot is just... It's unthinkable what happened to Lot. Lot experienced God. When Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees, who was walking with him? Lot. When Abraham built that altar to God, who was with him? Lot. Lot was probably helping collect the stones to build the altar. When they saw the giants and God's deliverance, who was there with Abraham? Lot. Lot saw the life of faith. He experienced the life of faith. But he lifted up his eyes and he pitched his tent towards Sodom. Oh. He didn't just barge right into Sodom. A man who's experienced God is not just going to barge right into Sodom. But he could sit under the flap of his tent And at the distance, he could see the lights of the city. He could hear the sounds of the music and smell the smells coming from Sodom. And he moved his tent a little closer. Then he moved his tent a little closer and a little closer and a little closer and a little closer until eventually we come to Genesis chapter 19. And when the two angels come to destroy the city of Sodom, when they enter into the city of Sodom, who do they find sitting in that gate of the city? Lot. Only the elders of the city sat in the gate of the city. It means Lot was a leader in the city of Sodom, a city that was filled with Sodomites. We're talking about a man who once walked with his uncle Abraham. This was a man who had experienced God, and now his mind has been so modified over a period of time that he has somehow coaxed himself into believing it's all right for him to live in Sodom. This is exactly what Christians do. When they make one little exception and another little exception and another little exception and they leave a red-hot position with the Lord and now they find themselves making exceptions and actually living in sin, condoning what used to really grieve them and now they're living right in it. Lot's mind. Lot. And by the way, he was a righteous man. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, he was a righteous man. The Bible tells us twice. But this righteous man had so messed up his mind with wrong thinking that when the angels came in, 
He knew they came to destroy the city. And what did he say to them? He said to them, don't stay in the streets all night. Come into my house. You know why he didn't want them to stay in the streets? Because he knew what they were going to see in the streets at night. He didn't want them to see it. He pleaded with them, come into our house. They came into his house. And the Bible says the men of Sodom, all the men of Sodom. This shows how perverse was Sodom. Every man of the entire city, the Bible says young and old, which means the perversion of Sodom was even affecting the children in the city of Sodom. And they all came to Lot's house. Think about that. It means all the Sodomites knew Lot's house. They knew exactly where he lived. He was well known in Sodom. And they said, bring out unto us the men that came unto you this night that we may know them. Understand it means that we may sexually rape them. What was a man like Lot living in a place like this? What was he doing there? And the Bible says that Lot came out and showed the door behind him and he addressed the Sodomites. Do you remember what he said to them? What did he say? The first thing he said, he looked out into that crowd and he said, brethren, brethren, he called them brothers. Do you see how far he had crossed the line that he would address that crowd and call them brethren? And his mind now was so reprobate, it was so affected by bombardment of wrong images and wrong hearing and wrong seeing that he said, don't do this wicked thing to these men. I have two girls and they've never known men. I'll give my girls to you, can do to them whatever is good in your eyes, but don't touch these two men because they came into my house this night. His mind was so corrupted. He had lost the ability to discern what was right and what was wrong. Don't touch the men, but hey, you can rape my girls. His mind was affected. His mind was affected. Finally, when he understood the city was going to be destroyed, the angels said to him, get your family, get your daughters. Now listen to this. Get your daughters and get your sons-in-laws. Wait a minute. He just said he had daughters who never knew men. But his daughters are married which means the perversion of Sodom has entered into his own family. His own family has been affected. And most Hebrew scholars say that these men only married for the sake of procreation. They had never known their wives sexually because they probably also were Sodomites. They were married, but they had never consummated their marriages. And when finally it was time for Lot to leave the city, the Bible says the angel hastened him because Lot didn't want to leave. They hastened him, and the Bible says they took him by the hand and put him outside the city, which means Lot was kicking and screaming on the way out of the city. He did not want to leave Sodom. And when you study what Peter writes about this, in 2 Peter chapter 2, it is amazing. Peter says, in seeing and hearing, he vexed his righteous soul. And the Greek tense means in seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing, he vexed his righteous soul. The word vexed, the word bastadzo, which means he tormented it until it was affected. By seeing and hearing, making one little exception, and another little exception. Now, the good news is he was delivered, but he wasn't delivered because of him. He was delivered because Abraham drew near to the Lord and prayed for him. And if you know anyone that has veered, don't give up. Draw near to the Lord. Your prayers can deliver them. But Lot is the example of a man whose mind became affected. Isn't that amazing? It's just amazing. So the word reprobate 
adukimas. When it says God gave them over, God released them to a reprobate mind. God allowed their mind to do whatever it wanted. And as a result of their mind thinking wrong, looking wrong, being bombarded by wrong information, wrong PR that's constantly being plummeted against the mind, the mind being modified, the mind loses the ability to know what is right and what is wrong. That is a reprobate mind. Now, I'm going to tell you something that I feel. Denise and I live in Russia, and Russia has its own problems. We love Russia, but we know it's not perfect. But when we come to America, we are just stunned by what's happening in this nation. We're stunned by it. We got off our airplane in Atlanta. We changed planes. We're walking down the bridge to the next plane. And the whole way down the bridge, there are family pictures, of different pictures of families all the way down and interspersed in between all the family pictures. This is the first thing we see when we come to America is a man who has his hand, his head laying on the head of his lover, just situated there among all the other family photos. I said to Denise, this is mental modification. They are bombarding this nation with the attempt to modify what people think. And now our poor children that are attending public school, they don't even know if they're a boy or if they're a girl. In fact, they're told they don't even have to know if they're a boy or a girl. They can decide later. The little generation right now, they are at risk, my friends. Is there anything worse you can do to a child than to say, we don't know what you are and we don't know what you'll be? You talk about create a bad beginning for a child's life and create a confusion rather than say, God made you as a beautiful little girl. You're going to grow up and be a wonderful woman. God made you to be a little boy. You're going to grow up and be a great man. What does it do to a child when you say, we don't know what you are and we don't know what you'll be? Their very identity is assaulted from the very first moment of their life. And the reprobateness that I'm describing about, this mental twisting, is starting from the very earliest age to really create a society that is a nomos without the law of God that will veer so far off track it will never find its way back. It's what's taking place. And we need to keep our head on straight. It's okay to think straight. You don't have to be crazy because everybody else is crazy. And it's okay to look at other people and say, they are not thinking right. Keep your head on straight. That does not mean you have a lack of compassion. Of course you have compassion. I've got great compassion for people. People that are going through sex change operations, oh my gosh, my heart just breaks for them. In preparation for the writing of my book, Pastor Jan, you know what I did? I watched an entire sex change operation on video. I wanted to know what really takes place. It is so horrific what they do that doctors should be prosecuted for doing that to a human being. It is just insane thinking. And do you know where this whole nonsense of transgenderism, sex change operations began? This is what is really, really shocking. It began in the Nazi prison camps of World War II in Auschwitz under the scalpel of Dr. Mingala. He was the one with his twisted doctors who began operating on people to see if he could turn men into women and women into men and have everything they did which was condemned. This one thing is reemerging and is being heralded as the new breakthrough that you can choose your own gender, my friends, it is Dr. Frankenstein, but he's no longer working in a castle. He is in the sophisticated hospitals of the Western world. It is twisted, and the devil is targeting not only you, he is after your kids, and he's after your grandchildren, and that's why we have to decide the rest of the world can go where they want to go, but we are going to stay on track. We're going to stay on track. 
this is the most serious moment we have ever lived. Jesus prophesied delusion. When you see delusion, it's the glaring signal. You have entered in time territory. The wrap-up is about to take place. Romans chapter 1 tells us explicitly when society has a general knowledge of God and walks away from it, the heart of society begins pumping darkness, 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 darkness. And by the way, friends, if you think we have seen darkness, you haven't seen anything yet compared to what is about to be unleashed in society. We're going to see marriage to animals. We're going to see relationship with robots. All of this by futurists are already being predicted. Oh, I just read Pastor Jan an article on what futurists are saying about the great possibility of marrying robots. Because, first of all, today they can make a robot so real that you don't even know that it's not a human being. But you can program it to do whatever you want it to do and you never have an argument with a robot. It's not far-fetched. It's happening. It's already happening. Different places around the world, you can already go. And I don't even want to go there. It's so dark. Delusion. Everybody say delusion. It's delusional thinking. How could people who once lived in a God-fearing nation come to such a place that they would even entertain thoughts like that? It's the process of robot reprobateness, gradually modifying society. Look again at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, means they had a knowledge of God, but they just decided that was no longer fitting, it was affecting their life, so they decided to put God aside. And God released them to reprobateness to do those things which are not convenient. And look at the result of this being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents without understanding. You see, here's the reprobateness covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, these are not stupid people. They know what the Bible says. They've just chosen to walk away from it. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but even have pleasure in them that do them. Now I'm going to read to you from my book a translation of these verses. Listen to this translation. I've never read this to anybody before, so this is a first. This is a literal translation. Although society once had a general acquaintance of God, a general knowledge of God, and a reverence for things related to God, a time came when people found it no longer fashionable to give God his due reverence. Rather than be grateful to God for their blessings, they forgot who blessed them and cease to be thankful. They turn from God, and as a result, they begin to veer morally, which resulted in their thinking becoming laced with error that affected how they reasoned about everything. They even alleged it was all right to believe things that are not supported by correlating facts and evidence, and eventually their conclusions became out of touch with reality. A normal heart pumps blood, but the heart of a God-rejecting society pumps and proliferates foolishness until it is filled with darkness that eventually spawns depravity, immorality, and godless behaviors. The so-called leaders of a God-rejecting society constantly assert that they are brilliant intellectuals of a new way of thinking, even though it is difficult to fathom how they could claim such a thing, regardless of what they assert. Their words and their ways of reasoning make them sound like those that are mentally ill or mentally deranged. How could anyone think what they propose is normal? Make no mistake about it. Those who think this way are clearly morons. That is a literal translation of this verse. 
Now turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Right now we're talking about what's happening in society. But wait a minute, we're living in the last of the age, right? So what does the Holy Spirit say about the church? Well, let's look at it. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. The word retus, the word retus here translated expressly describes something categorical, emphatic, unquestionable. Now the Spirit speaks in the strongest and clearest of language. Make no mistake, the Holy Spirit clearly says that in the what? Latter times, the word latter is not even the normal word for latter. This is the word husteras. It means when there's no more time left, there's nothing more to come. You're at the very, very end. Some, praise God, it's not everybody. Some shall what? Depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. Well, notice what it does not say. It does not say some shall reject the faith. Doesn't say that. Rejecting is deliberate. Departing is very slow, methodical, and it can even be unintentional. This word departing is a Greek word which means to put distance between yourself and something else. When it says some shall depart from the faith, It means they're going to begin to back away from the faith, put distance between themselves and the faith. And the faith in Greek has a definite article, which means this is talking about the faith or the clear sound teaching of Scripture. Well, that's what we used to believe, but now we're beginning to rethink things and they're beginning to depart from, not reject from, but begin to modify the way they're thinking, step away from the faith, even putting distance between themselves and what they once believed. It's not a rejection, it's a departure. It's a departure. Slow. In fact, it's so slow, it's like a lot. Those that are departing, they may not even realize that they're in transition. But step by step, they're slowly moving away from and putting space between themselves and what they used to believe. And the Bible tells us why. Giving heed. Everybody say giving heed. In Greek, that's the word from the word prosyuko. Pros echo. The word pros means to lean towards something. The word echo means to embrace. So now we find that rather than standing on the word, the faith, the way they once did, pros, they're now leaning in a new direction, echo, in order to embrace. Well, they can't embrace something new as long as they're embracing what they used to hold. And to embrace something new, they have to put away what they used to believe, put it away, release it, in order to embrace something new. And here we see open-mindedness. Let's not, let's not be so stuck. Let's not be so bigoted. Let's not be so narrow-minded. Let's be more open-minded. The problem is they become so open-minded that their brains have fallen out of their heads. Their brains have fallen out of their heads. Keep your brain in your head. But now they're leaning toward departing from The faith, the definite article from the long-held, concrete, well-established teaching of Scripture, the Bible, rejecting the authority of the Bible, even calling into question what the Bible teaches, and leaning toward, really, the spirit of the age. And the Apostle Paul says, make no mistake, behind this is the activity of, what does he say? seducing spirits, and guess what? That word seducing is the same word which Jesus used in Matthew 24, verse 4, which Paul used in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. It is the word planel. They are spirits that cause you to leave a well-established path and to wander, to wander, to wander. Seducing spirits, it can be translated delusional spirits or spirits that cause delusion. 
And then he adds, and doctrines of demons. Hmm. Well, nobody wants a doctrine of a demon. If you know a demon's talking to you, you're not going to listen to that. Why are they listening to it if it's doctrines of demons? Well, the word doctrines is a Greek word didaskalia. It's really a play on words because it's the word didasko, which means to teach, compounded with the word kalos, which is, means good. You put the two words together. It is really well-packaged ideas, sophisticated ideas. When the devil comes, he's not going to sound like a devil. He's going to come to you with a whole new way of thinking. He's going to bring a whole program, a whole new kind of modification that will make your life easier. And by the way, isn't that what everybody's doing anyway? And it will just be so seducing and will sound so right. But Paul says, working behind this well-packaged advertising scheme that's going to bombard society, it's demons. It's demons. And if you keep reading the verses, the very following verses says, it is teaching that will sear your conscience with a hot iron. We're talking about a mind that is reprobate. It's seared. It's lost its ability to feel. And in this verse, chapter 4, verse 1, now the Spirit speaks what? Oh, expressly. The word ratus, it's where we get the word rhema. But when it's ratus, it means the Spirit speaks emphatically. The Spirit speaks categorically. He's pointing to the very end of the age when there's no more time, when you've come to the very, very end and you can't go any further. He says, even some in the church are going to be seduced to step away from taste pistis. That's what the Greek says. The faith. It's not faith for miracles, not faith for money, it's not faith for signs and wonders. It's the faith, the teaching of Scripture. That's why we're in such serious trouble. The Bible is disappearing from most churches. The Bible is not even being taught in church today. Pastor Jan, I can take you with me across the nation. People don't bring their Bibles to church. People are becoming biblically illiterate. Pastors are preaching things. I look at them and think, what in the world are you doing? Only the Bible has the power to transform life. It is not a reference among other references. It is the reference. It is the rule. It is the guide for life. Great that you listen to gurus of all kind, but what does the Bible say? It is the Bible that has the power to transform lives. But yet there is a stepping away from the faith. You know why? Because the devil knows. The devil knows it is the one thing that will cause people to keep their heads on straight. And if he can get people to release the Bible... He can lead them so far off track. He can modify their thinking, destroy them mentally, spiritually, corrupt them, get them so far off track that like an animal, they'll never be able to find their way back to the pen. That's the age we're living in. That's the age we're living in. It's kind of a wake-up call. But it's nothing that you don't already know. I just showed it to you in the Bible. You already knew this. You already knew this. And the task to all of us is to keep our head on straight. To keep our head on straight. Paul said to Timothy twice, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 4, twice he said to Timothy, take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself. Do you know what that Greek phrase means? A literal translation. Get a grip on yourself. That is a literal translation of that. Get a grip on yourself. Come on, guys. Get a grip on yourself. 
it's all right to say something's not right. And it doesn't mean you don't have compassion and you don't have love. It doesn't mean you don't want to reach everybody and love everybody, but you do not have to develop a doctrine of inclusion that says everybody is all right. Everybody is not all right. I'm not all right. I need to change. Who doesn't need to change? And even though God loves everybody, friends, Jesus died because of sin. Sin is real. It did not go away. We can say that it's all right. It is not all right. People still go to hell. By the way, that's something else you don't ever hear about anymore. Hell just kind of disappeared. Kind of disappeared. But I want to tell you, it's still there. People still going there. People are going to hell. Hell is a reality. Jesus spoke about hell more than he spoke about heaven. There's a famous preacher. I'm not going to say his name. I would never do that. And then I'm going to close. I heard that he said this. I didn't want to believe it, so I decided to listen to the entire series. He said it. He said, the time has come for us to unhitch from the teachings of the Old Testament. I'm talking about the pastor of the largest church in America. Unhitch from the teachings of the Old Testament. He said, furthermore, the Ten Commandments have no relevance in the life of a Christian. Lawless. That's what the Bible means when it says lawless. We're going to create our own law. He said, furthermore, if you base your faith on the New Testament, your faith is built on a house of cards. He said it. I heard him say it. I thought, well, why does anybody even go to his church? If the Bible is a house of cards, why do we even come to church? What are we doing? Because it's a social program that helps people. That's a form of godliness, form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. It'll never happen in this church. Never happen here. Make sure it doesn't happen in your church. And if you even sniff the scent of it, you need to hightail it out of there and get somewhere where you're going to hear the Bible taught because the Bible is the only thing that has the power to transform. It's the only thing. You know, I've got a TV program that's on right now across the world five days a week. And even in Moscow, Denise and I have paid for a high fluid satellite so we can have Christian TV in our home. I'm going to tell you, I don't allow every Christian broadcaster to come into my house. Uh, be careful who you listen to. You are responsible for what you eat. God's going to hold them responsible for what they preach. But if you know you're eating questionable material, you know what? Then you're responsible if you get sick. If you think there's something wrong with it, turn it off or change the channel. I've got preachers. I've said to Denise, I better never hear that voice in our home again. Hey, it's my house. I've got to guard my house, and I'm not letting anything laced with poison in my diet. So, Pastor Jan, that's what was on my heart tonight. <laughs> and I just want to ask you, what is your commitment to your Bible? Are you as committed to your Bible as you used to be? Is it still the law of God for you? Or have you begun to modify in order to make room for your kids? Oh, that's a hard one. Or maybe you're modifying because you love your grandchildren and you don't want to reject them because of bad decisions. Friends, if you embrace their bad decisions, you're not helping them. You're damning them. You're damning them. They need your voice. They need truth. When they get in trouble, they're going to need to know where to go to. Doesn't mean you have to judge them or reject them. You know, Jesus was with prostitutes. He was with drunkards. He was with everybody. And Jesus never changed the truth. They always knew they could depend on him 
to tell the truth, but it was mixed with love. And we're living in the day when we have to move in truth that is mixed with love. Father, we thank you for the word of God. Lord, you've chosen us to live in this time. And that means we have the grace to do it. We have the grace to do it. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to keep our heads on straight in this world that seems like it's going crazy. You tell us to get a grip on ourselves. We ask you to help us to do that. And Lord, help us to really examine ourselves to see if we have been subject to modification that's wrong. And if we have, you ask you to help us change. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Did you get something new tonight? Thank you for listening to me.